I think Islam hates us. They have done nothing except wreak havoc and terror for our faith and our religion. When we stand up to those who oppress our communities, that Allah accepts from us that as a form of jihad. Foundations of society are fragile. We must be the shepherds of our own civilization. If anyone answers either yes or no without making necessary distinctions, both are not telling the truth. They're lying. Father, we pray that your word will become a hammer that breaks rocks into pieces. That you will raise up in this nation pulpits and prophets that will call the nation back to repentance. Will you distance yourself from those who think differently or will you join us at the table and talk about what is really important? This is the Maida Initiative, conversation without compromise. I'm currently in Manila right now. Oh, okay. So what time is it there? It is currently 2 a.m. here. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's 7. It's 7 p.m. here. No, 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 no problem at all. It's, uh, I'm trying to put out an episode a week. I made th- that, I made that, I made the decision. And yeah. I, it's, it, it's worth it to get ahead of time. And this is such an interesting subject to me that I, I figured it was worth whatever I had to do. So I'll just go straight back to sleep after this. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so, um, tell me a little bit about yourself. What, what are you, you're a you're a teacher. You're someone involved in politics. Is a is yeah. not as your main thing, but that's something you're involved in. Mm-hmm. So, um, my name is Tesnia Dries from Tunis, Tunisia. I'm 25, and I'm an English teacher. Um, and I have always been involved in, you know, so many uh, civil society activities. I'm part of many uh, NGOs, international NGOs and local NGOs. And I'm also active politically speaking, but I'm not part of any uh, political party. I'm just, you know, a follower of, you know, what's happening in the political scene in Tunisia and elsewhere. Of course, this was not really possible prior to the revolution. But my dad has been part of, um, um, you know, the... Um, you know, a party which is against the regime. Um, so I have always been involved um, in politics, like knowing what's happening because the patients did not know what's it. But there is a kicker, kind of, you know, um, they know what was happening. So they, they were always um, understanding of everything. And uh, whether it's from the left or from the right. So I was part of that category. And uh, yeah, and that's why right after re- the revolution, I also kept going to every strike, to every um, demonstration. And, and then after the revolution, the civil society um, you know, world sparkled uh, in Tunisia because it was not really possible before. So I took part in... And all of these things, and it made my life really busy, but it was, it's always worth it. So give me some, give me some background on, on Tunisia. So obviously there's a rich ancient history in Tunisia. Uh, yeah. Where Carthage was, which was the main enemy of Rome for a period of time, yeah. and, and then was a prospering part of the Roman Empire itself. Uh, and then... Mm-hmm. And, and, and then what happens from there? What's, how did... Oh, wow. <laughs> don't, 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 You're you know. bringing me back there. Yeah, yeah, no, sure. Absolutely. We, don't, we don't need to start with Hannibal. But <laughs> how, how did the modern nation of Tunisia come into being? Yeah, well, there's a lot of history in this. But, you know, after the, you know, the famous um, battle between Carthage and Rome and they kept taking over power... Um, we, um, you know, Tunisia is in a very important place on the map of the world. It's like between, uh, Af- at the top of Africa and facing Europe and the Mediterranean and everything. So it has always been, you know, a place where all civilizations clashed and met and all of these things. So we had, um, the Spanish, um, and then, um, the Spanish really, um, uh, tried to, you know, make a mess out of out of Tunis and even the Zaytuna Mosque, which is the very you know the first mosque um, in in um, first mosque in, in in Africa. Also, we have also another one of the first mosques in Africa in Cairo, and both are in Tunisia. They turned it into a zoo, 
um, and um, you know, yeah, they did. And it was thanks to the Turks, the, the Ottoman Empire, sorry, um, that saved. Um, you know, the, pre pretty much uh, Tunisia became part of uh, the the Ottoman Empire. Um, but of course, before that, um, you know, Arabs came uh, from you know uh, Arabia, and they introduced Islam to um, to to Tunisia. And it wasn't called Tunisia before, of course. Um, so we had the we had the local, um, um, you know, the local inhabitants here, and they the French people enjoy calling them the Berbers, um, and. Um, um, and um, they're like um, a race on themselves. They're not Arabs. But after the Islam got introduced to Tunisia and a um, lot of people immigrated, um, you know, there there's no such thing as a separate race. They they got really they got married with the Arabs and um, and yeah. And then we do have minorities here, uh, but you know they, they we're kind of the same race more or less. Um, and um, yeah. And then after we became part of the Ottoman Empire after the, for many, many years, after the fall of the Ottoman Empire, of course, uh, the French colonization took place in 1881. Um, and um, it stayed until uh, 1956, uh, 1955, 1956. Um, and then we had a so-called savior, whose name is uh, Habib Bourguiba, who was the one man who, uh, managed to kick France out, but it wasn't really the case because he was not alone. Of course, he did so many good things, but he was not alone in that. But what he did is that he tried to, you know, to just um, take the credit for everything. And then he became the president of Tunisia for life, even though it was a republic. Um, and he had some political opponents at the time. And then um, he actually did not, um, so someone took over him. Who was the you know the minister minister of interior who was the the dictator Ben Ali? I'm sure you you heard uh, you heard about him. Everybody did because we, the revolution was against him. So this person took power from 1987 until 2011, um, and he was really horrible at all. You know, dictator. He jailed everyone who dared say no to him from the left to right. Um, in the Tunisian society, we invested a lot in education. Um, so we're educated, um, you know, educated people. But at the same time, we liked a lot of, um, you know, freedom, like freedom of expression, um, freedom in the political scene, nothing, there was nothing at all, just one party who ruled everything. Um, and then when the revolution sparked in 2011, um, everyone came together from the left to right. Um, and then we managed to kick him out. Uh, but then, um, you know, we tried, we've been trying for nine years almost, um, and everything is perfect compared to other Arab, you know, countries like Syria or Egypt or, or Libya or Yemen. Uh, but we still have our own problems. So, so far we did many um, free elections. Um, we have the president, we just had one actually last month. So we elected the uh, president and parliament and everything, but we still have many ideological problems. So in Tunisia, we're like 99% uh, Muslims and Arabs, but we do have some Jews in the um, island of Jerba they've always been there and they even have a very sacred uh, synagogue which people which Jews from all over the world come to visit and we perfectly get along together we have some Christians um, but you know the majority of us are like identical the prob the only problems that we do have are purely ideological some people are like um, lefty or or more conservative and this reflects on the political life and on the social life um, so, as you can see, we're not like Lebanon, for example, with a lot of, you know, um, religions and sects um, or in any other place with a lot of races. Uh, we speak the same language. We're, we're like almost identical. I don't know whether this is a good thing or a bad thing, but, uh, but um, we do have our own problems and we're working on them. I don't know. I'm just speaking. I don't know if you have questions. So, uh... 
yeah, so going back to the, the, uh, the revolution in 2011, because that had uh-huh. much, much wider implications. So it starts, I, so correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Mohammed Bouazizi? Yes, yeah, the, the he was the one who sparkled it, yeah. So a uh, tragic story, he's, he's uh, bi- it's trying small, to set himself on fire. Yeah. Small independent business, frustrated with government corruption, uh, tries to complain to the government, they don't do anything about it. So he just sets himself on fire and then that, that figuratively sets the whole Arab world on fire. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it wasn't really as simple as this because many people try to do the same. Many people actually did the same before him. And that was just this straw that just broke it all. Um, but um, it, it, a lot of people try to do the same, even more tragic things. But at that point of time, um, we were try- we were having um, like we were we were waiting for the elections of Ben Ali um, for the one hundredth time, <laughs> you know. Um, and the political scene was a little bit tense. And that 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 moment, we just we were just waiting for something to happen, you know. And it happened. So that's why everybody came together for the first time um, ever. The left the leftists, the right, the conservatives, um, everyone basically, uh, people, like ordinary people, even those who were not politically active were really harmed by uh, Ben Ali because his family uh, basically was, um, you know, robbing everyone. They were trying to get in business with everyone and, and, and robbing them off. So the entire, the entire, um, you know, uh, you know, the entire country suffered from Ben Ali, whether politically speaking or economically. So that's why we came together as, as just one person. And uh, we went into demonstrations and, um, you know, people were killed and injured and, and taken and, and jailed and everything. But then we somehow persisted. And till this day, we don't understand why he, he, he chose to, to run away to Saudi Arabia. He could have just stayed here and the things would have been completely different um but he 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 chose to to just um leave and that gave us you know more power to continue because you know all of his all all, be, all everyone who who was associated with him the fact that he left the country made them weaker and weaker so that's why we were able to um you know um go for the first constitutional assembly everyone from Tun- from tunisia who were living abroad many many people started to come back to the country and um it was it was smooth uh, but with a lot of challenges as well which was not really the case with unfortunately with the other arab countries because they were inspired by us but our revolution was not really um, organized you know in egypt for example they chose the very date to do the the big the big demonstration in Syria, they started to call for you know um, you know uh, reforms and everything. It, it, us, it was not really the case. It was completely spontaneous, and for them, the other regimes were were prepared kind of to to deal with these demonstrations. But for Ben Ali, he was not really prepared because it was the first thing. Um, and also we have you know. Um, uh, Western intervention, um, you know, foreign intervention, uh, which they tried to do in Tunisia, but um, I think the will of the people was mightier, and they tried so many times to do a lot of, you know, military coup. And one important thing uh, why Tunisia is succeeding is because we don't have the, you know, the tradition of having uh, of the military having power in this country. We don't have a strong military. I mean not in the sense that it's not really strong to protect the country, but it's not politicized. Uh, it has always been there to just uh, protect the country and that's all. They never interfered in the political life, which is absolutely not the case with Egypt and, and Syria. So a lot of these minor things are combined to, to allow us to, to have a success story somehow compared to the other countries. But saying this, um, People always hear whenever we complain about economy or any other thing, they tell us, oh, you have to be grateful and look at the other Arab countries. You're really better off. It's true, but we could have been better, you know? So, so we always, you know, we're always grateful that we did not really fall into the abyss of 
uh, you know, just like the other countries. But at the same time, there are a lot of challenges, a lot of problems to deal with, especially economically speaking. But in terms of, you know, political freedom, freedom of expression, guaranteeing free, you know, elections, we're, 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 we're now the best. We actually, this, this last election, we ranked 26th um um in um you know uh, comp uh so with it we're 26 in the world uh because we know how to you know uh, abide by the you know the criteria to uh, organize um free and democratic elections so we're really you know doing our best to achieve a lot of um a lot of um things that we have never been able to do if we were still under the banali era yeah <laughs> That's 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 really interesting. So you're you you've been basically been able to have free and fair elections. There's legitimate ability to have freedom of expression in the country for the first time, and that so so that's something. This freedom of expression movement that's something that you're actually involved in in a scale beyond Tunisia, right? Yeah. So tell me about tell me about how you got involved in the tell me what the Islam and Liberty movement is and tell me how you got involved in it. Okay, so uh, after the revolution, as I told you, the civil society activism and NGOs, the entire thing sparkled in Tunisia. We were we were we started to be able to join um, international organizations, foundations, networks, and everything. And I've always been part of this. Um, and in 2011, I got connected to, I mean, I've always been part of these, you know, clubs and NGOs. There were, some of them were really secret. We had this al um, uh network, which is uh, called after, uh, you know, the, the scientist uh, al Uh Sorry, he was, um, you know, he was really famous. Uh, he, he was a writer, a famous writer. Um, and uh, we used to gather, I was I was still a little girl. Dad would take me. Um, we just go there and discuss books and have people from abroad if if we can. And you know, it was like um, a cultural thing, um, which was the only uh, functioning NGO uh, in, in Tunisia before before the revolution. And then um, I found myself connected to this um, uh, initiatives of change foundation, which I'm still part of it now, and I'm leading. Uh, the Tunisian branch. Branch. It's it's an international foundation. Uh, Gandhi is is has been associated with it. Um, it's it was uh, it was founded by Frank Bookman. Uh, it's basically uh, living in, under the standards of y y you will never change the world until you are the change that you want to see in the world. That's what Gandhi said. So we would I tra I traveled to so many places and to India to the UK to Switzerland to France to Lebanon many many countries where i met a lot of people who are leading the change in their in the in their countries so basically there's they're not working on a specific um area you could you could be working on charity work you could be working on self development any 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 kind of thing that you would think that you know your country or your area is in 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 need for so for example in lebanon uh, initiatives change lebanon they worked a lot during the you know the civil um uh, the civil war and a lot of people um, you know they managed to convince people who were shooting their the brothers and sisters to stop doing that and to actually convince their leaders to stop doing that so it's really something heavy in Tunisia I'm trying to work on uh, you know as I told you we have a lot of um, ideological problems so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do that I'm, I'm trying to have circles with people from different political point of views and have them discuss and have them you know, understand that they don't own the truth and we just left Tunisia in so many different ways and we can always find a consensus and we can always, you know, um, have a middle ground. And that's exactly what happened in Tunisia. I, I forgot to mention earlier that the reason why um, we are still a success story is because Islamists and, and secularists um, have agreed to, you know, um, lead the country in a shared way, as I can say. So. Some of them have the government, and the uh, the others have the you know presidency or something like that. So so something that would never happen in, in that couldn't happen in in Egypt, for example, with the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, so yeah, so that's what I'm trying to do. And we have um, 
uh, annual uh, meetings, we have discussions. We focus a lot on discussions, on telling success stories to people to get inspired, um, to talk to each other. Uh, we have something called Quiet Time, seems like a cult but it's not really so you would just um wake up in the morning or at the end of the day whenever you feel convenient to do that and you just you know remain quiet and have um like um a, a, um you know jot, jot down notes of how you dealt with your day and what are the things that you want to do and actually do them and if you want to share share your purposes or goals with with your friends or with your relatives you can do that and they would support you these minor things are you know are really important in our lives and we have a lot of success stories based on these small gestures of of success this is one of the one of the things i'm working on right now and um it could be as as tiny as you know grouping some people to have a chat about something or we can go out and, and and do some acts of good some charity work some many things um this is the initiative change foundation that i'm part of and uh in regards to the islam and liberty network well i participated with them in one of the workshops i always make sure to apply on anything really that has to do with politics or religion development or anything and i was with them in um last summer in a workshop um and then um you know i i, I started um working with them because this really inspiring me trying to bring islam and liberty in the same in the same sentence actually which is not really something for something guaranteed for most of people you know islamophobia is something it, it's a, it's the it's a it's a western thing a lot of people you know fear islam because you know everyone who's really trying to represent islam in a wrong way you know isis and all of these things but at the same time in muslim majority countries we do have um you know poverty we do have authoritarianism um we do have um you know um sectarianism a lot of problems that have nothing nothing to do with with islam and and and, and the freedom of islam and the notion of freedom that islam calls for initially so we also have a lot of work to do um in in in, in the muslim majority countries so for me islam and liberty network i can i can work with them in two angles, whether in the Muslim majority countries to fight all of these um, diseases of authoritarianism and, and, and sectarianism and, um, you know, um, all of these problems and misconceptions of, of, of Islam by Muslims themselves, themselves and also um, in, in the Western world to fight Islamophobia. Yeah, so it, it, it really, um, it, it's really one of my, um, you know, um, th things that I'm interested in. Okay, yeah. so, so before we get into the arguments you would have for liberty, let's, mm -hmm. let, let's talk about the, the forces working against you. So okay. you're talking about people, what you're calling misconceptions of Islam, uh, mm -hmm. which, which basically prop up authoritarian ideals what what do you think those are what are the what are the forces within the islamic world that would work against uh, personal freedom freedom of expression liberty as a whole yeah for example when it comes to the issue of women we have a lot of a lot of um muslim majority countries i don't want to name them but you know you know them where um, um women are very marginalized uh, in their societies they're just um, you know, um, pinned down to just housewives, which, which absolutely, there's nothing wrong with that. But they're, they're, if if the woman wants to go out and work or study or anything, they're 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 just not allowed to, um, you know, um, in the name of Islam, which is absolutely ridiculous for me because even the wives of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and and the the many wives that we read about um, in his lifetime, they were um, they were active in you know. In, in so many ways and they were meeting men and and they were just normal people and that it has it has absolutely nothing to do with with the fact that they were they were they are women um so this is something really important for me and um even when i travel i can feel it sometimes um in in other in, in other countries they just look at me and they say oh you're not supposed to 
to be here and to travel alone and to you know work and, and all these things and by the way being a tunisian is is really awesome because um compared to many other arab countries even we do enjoy a lot of a lot of um uh, a lot of um, liberty and freedom and and it's uh, it's it's really in our in, in our constitution even it's not just something like um that a woman would would rebel or do whatever she wants no it's it's something that the society accepts um so the 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 the, the issue of women is really important uh for me because there's a lot of misconceptions by uh, muslims themselves um many other things like i don't know um the the issue like the freedom of expression itself having a lot of like the the the, the possibility to join parties and to establish parties we have this corrupt idea that you can't really say no to to the ruler or you can't really uh, you know contradict what they say I mean, this is correct if, if, and it's Islamic, if the ruler is a good ruler. But if the ruler is not, it's also Islamic to overthrow them, overthrow them you know? And we have a lot of um, author authoritarian um, uh, rulers in the Muslim world who are using this um, argument to just protect themselves. And, and they say, oh, you have no right to, 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 to say no to me because I rule you. This is absolutely ridiculous for me. Um, and we have corruption as well, um, economically speaking, politically speaking, like if there is like um, someone who's like a guide for, for the tribe or something, we, we don't have the tribe system in Tunisia, luckily, so but there is a lot of tribal system, systems in, in the Arab world, the Muslim world, um, so if that man is the leader of the tribe, he can't really by no means contradict them in, in any way, and this is wrong if they are doing something wrong and if they're doing unjust, injustice to people, you, ha you need to stop, to stop them regardless of their status. So, so all of these things need to be really uh, you know, fought against and in the name of Islam, even though they are there in the name of Islam as well. So this is where the contradiction lies. So, so, so I guess here's the, I guess part of the difficulty with this is that in any, in any side of an argument like this, they're going to have certain parts of the life of the prophet, hadith, Islamic history that they're appealing to. And you're going to have your, your version of things that you're appealing to. How do you make a case that a true interpretation of Islam would favor liberty and freedom well there are pillars in islam that they're not they cannot really change they cannot really be changed you know um, and we're not really disagreeing when it comes to pillars but the problem lies in the interpretation the ishtihad you know um so um it, and it depends uh depends on the intention of the one who wants to make this interpretation if that person is known for their corruption um, it's, it's perfectly normal that they're using it, they're mis misusing it. If that person wants to free the society, free women, without contradicting the pillars of Islam, then that's perfectly fine. And we have a lot of examples when it comes to this. But, um, you know, Islam has come primarily to, 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 to make people live with dignity and freedom. Um, the fact that they you know you can you can study the you know the arabia before before islam in the time of, of jahiliya um they were basically eating each other they were you know worshiping each other they were all over the place when islam came the, he, it organized the entire society it built the very first you know uh, you know the 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 constitution of medina um everyone the, the notes the, the you know the rights of every person, the rights of every person, uh, whether they're Jews or Christians or Muslims or just atheists, were written down. So Islam came to organize everything. The li it's a lifestyle. So everyone who's trying to mess with that is, is completely wrong and is completely off track in it and does not absolutely, you know, does not represent Islam in any way. So that's the, you know, that's the criteria that we can measure with. So say, say with the Charter of Medina. 
So you, mm-hmm. you're, you're right. It does all those things. It gives people specific individual rights. However, it does concentrate all political and religious power into the hands of one man, which is Muhammad. Uh, so if, uh, what would you say to somebody who uses that as, a, as an argument to say, okay, well, we should, the, the Muslim world should have one leader who should have supreme religious and political authority over all aspects of life? Yeah. Okay. So the the charge of Medina does not really con- uh, concentrate everything on that person specifically because he does. It's just like a moral figure. He he does have, of course, a prerogatives, but many other persons. It's a high, like many other persons. They have roles as well to maintain, and the fact that it's all about Muslims because the the majority are Muslims, you know. But this means that you know they're taking care of the other minorities as well whether they're religious minorities or social minorities or every, everybody's taken care of you know which is necessary which is not really the case with with the minority muslims in 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 france for example or many other countries where m- women cannot really wear hijab for example just because they're a minority this was not really um you know in medina you know centuries ago uh, one person who's who's atheist was taken care of so having people now from the Western world trying to lecture us about this is really ridiculous, you know? So um, everybody's taken care of, um, no matter what their religion or views or anything that on that, at that time, centuries ago. Um, so um, now we really, th- we really think that it's really useless to try to attack Islam on this basis because when it comes to freedom of expression or guaranteed freedoms no matter what 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 nature they are it's guaranteed perfectly um when it comes to politics and who has what of course the majority would have you know the you know it's you know it's it's democracy the majority rules the minority but this does not mean that the minority is 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 not really enjoying their um, their full freedom to do whatever they want to, to exercise their religious freedom or social freedom or any kind of freedom they want. So I think it's like a it's it's a faked problem that we're talking about. It's better to focus on how to revolutionize and make these um, you know um, Islamic values. Um, you know, uh, modern because we can do that. A lot of a lot of things that they used to be uh, possible before that are not possible now, and vice versa. And with the notion of interpretation, we can always do this. You know, um, so for example, women before were not really able to travel without you know someone to protect uh, because per- obviously it was really dangerous to to travel uh, before for for them and it's always for a good reason to protect them now it's perfectly normal for women or any man also to 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 travel uh because it's it's safe uh so having for example people who are still thinking that way from the muslim world is ridiculous so i'm i'm really attacking everyone right now westerners who are you know um you know trying to make fun of um you know um the notion of freedom in islam when it has always been there centuries ago and muslims who are misusing islam and 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 just sticking to to things that are not really up to date is also ridiculous so we really have to fight this 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 idea of just trying to um you know attack the other or trying to preserve what we have without really thinking that's what I'm really trying to work on right now with everything that I'm doing. So, so some of the things the so, so I, I think having, having read lots of Islamic history and a, a lot of the Hadith as well, that there are certainly things that are deeply rooted in uh, Islam, which give people some liberties. Uh, and I think there's a lot of misconceptions about the early Islamic conquests and what they did to religious minorities. Uh, what I've actually what I actually found through through reading is the, the usually the the worst treatment of minorities was actually during the Ottoman times, and that was 
So it was, it was a long time after the original Arab conquest that minorities started getting a really bad deal. Obviously, it goes up and down at different yeah. times in history. But so, so a couple of things that are deep-rooted in, in there. So one thing would be apostasy laws. So, so it's, it, it, there's always been a case that if somebody is is a non-Muslim within, a cert, within, within certain parameters, they've been reasonably free to hold to what they, they believe. And, and you've got the Pact of Umar, which is pretty ancient, uh, would, which would forbid certain activities, but would nevertheless still allow people to retain their religion. But then you've, also, you've always had these apostasy laws. Could, could you speak to that of how apostasy laws should or should not play in with modern Islam and, and where people are getting those from. Okay, so um, we have a very famous verse in the Quran that says that, um, you know, um, I'm just summarizing it, you know, everybody has the, the right um, to just accept and embrace whatever religion they want. And um, if it's by force, then as if they're not really, um, you know, choosing that religion in the first place, because everything has to be out of free, free choice. You know, freedom of choice is really the pillar, the pillar of Islam. Um, so if someone accepts Islam, that's perfectly fine. If someone wants to just stop being Muslim, um, that's perfectly fine too. Guess what? It's perfectly fine too. It's, and it's according to Islam too. The problem with um, um, apostasy laws is that, for example, um, we had this problem with uh, what, what happened uh, with, with, with Abu Bakr before, um, if you know what I'm talking about. Yes, the, uh, the when, laws. Yeah, exactly. So the, the fact that he chose to uh, rage a war against these people is because they started to have a movement to get people out of Islam. It was not really a singular individual decision to walk out of islam these people like started to have like a political party to like encourage people to stop being muslims just because the prophet passed away this is absolutely wrong and you have to fight it but if it is a, an individual choice like for example we do have a, we hear a lot of people in in, in youtube and in, in, in on the internet um, deciding to just stop accepting Islam and embracing Christianity or being just an atheist or anything and they are so scared of their Muslim parents and Muslim society, that's wrong that's perfectly wrong, it's really ridiculous that they have to keep pretending to be Muslims just in front of their parents but in truth they are not Muslims even in the, in the you know it's, it, so this is, this is the difference if it is an individual uh, decision to walk from Islam, it's it's perfectly normal. Just like it is accepted when someone wants to embrace Islam individually, it's an individual free decision. You know, if it starts to become a movement to you know force or even call people to you know stop being Muslims or stop being Christians or anything, I don't think it would be really welcome even in Christianity or Judaism. You know, so this is the idea. So we have a misconception, like we have a very famous um, hadith or saying that says, uh, whoever changes uh, their religion, kill them. Yes. You know, the, exactly. So the change here, this is the, the beauty of the, Arab, of the Arabic uh, language. The, the, what, what is meant by change here is making changes within the religion. For example, I don't know. Saying that uh, alcohol is, 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 is allowed, saying that adultery is not a sin, saying that, I don't know, these things that are perfectly clear that they're sins in the Islamic system, trying to, to, to say that this is, this is not a sin anymore. Well, if you choose to do it, you're absolutely free. You know, nobody tells you not to do these things. You're absolutely free. But saying that I'm a Muslim and I'm doing this because it's not really wrong in islam that's change of religion this is the name you know this is the problem because it messes up with an entire system if you are you want to do it out of indiv an individual act you're perfectly allowed to do that but don't talk in the name on, on behalf of an entire religion because it has pillars and it has a system 
you know we're talking about a, 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 an entire system you know the problem with islam is you know, islam is perfect but muslims are not just like any other system so if you mess up with the system that's really dangerous but if you want to just embrace whatever you want any action under your own decision not under the, the under islam or in, under any religion where it's perfectly stated that these things are correct and allowed and the other things are not so if you want to do that good for you you perfectly islam itself encourages you to be free you know but not under do not do not try to attribute attribute things that are not there in the first place you know if you want to do some interpretation that's perfectly good for you but don't enforce it into a system where everything is clear in it so this is what it what it what is what it's meant by whoever changes um you know the um the religion um kill them but if if you want to change your religion and become and embrace a totally different religion of course you're free to do that because you're only Muslim if you choose to do that, if you choose to be Muslim wholeheartedly, not forced. So, so, so somebody who, who walks away from Islam, there's no issue there. But say my, my, my Saudi friend who wants to convince, he's convinced that the Quran never actually says alcohol is haram. Mm -hmm. but, but, and, and then if you point to the deed, he, he'll just say, I don't, I don't believe the hadith. That's the kind of thing that's spoken against here. Well, I mean, in the Quran, it's perfectly stated that alcohol is, 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 is um, you know, is, is forbidden. If you choose to drink, but saying that I am, I'm wrong in that and I, I hope I will, you know, stop doing that or I know I'm, I'm, I'm wrong, but I'm not stopping. It's, it's totally fine where I can't stop. It's totally fine. Everybody, we're not really perfectly obedient by everything. All of us are, you know? It's all in the intentions. If you, if you do something while knowing that you are wrong and you can't stop or you don't want to stop, that's perfectly different from saying that, no, it's not there, refusing to see it, refusing to, to, to just admit that it's there, you know? That's the problem that we, we are now in. This is this is really a core problem in the in the in the Islamic world. Refu like as if you are lying to yourself. The thing is there, very bright, very clear, and you're just trying to say no, it's not there. It's it's fine to admit that you're you don't want to abide by it. It's not nobody's gonna kill you. By the way, we're not we're not really behind people trying to kill them, you know. Um, and by the way, the killing itself kill them it does not mean we have a lot of um you know um something that is apparent and, and something that is hidden in the in the in the meaning and the layers of of the arabic language that's why Quran is written in the arabic language so kill them um it could be silence them from expressing because we have a lot of people especially now who are trying to be you know religious people are trying to tell people to follow them and embrace the fact that alcohol is permissible, for example, adultery is fine, kill their, kill their voices, stop them from talking on behalf of, of, of Muslims and Islam and Muslim scholars. That's the idea. If you want to do that, good for you, but don't just attract people to, to, to follow you. So, obviously you've got different traditions of scholarship. And, and Absolutely. so... On, on the one hand, you've got the school of scholarship that would say you take those things literally. And there is a, there is a long history of taking those things literally versus what you're saying yeah. is that there's, there's some nuance and some depth to that. So, so if, if, I, if somebody is a Muslim, why should they listen to your interpretation versus the interpretation of, say, the Muslim Brotherhood or... Uh, or whoever else well i did not tell them to to listen to me or to whoever they need to choose that's the thing it's entire they're entirely entitled to choose whoever they want to listen to because in islam we 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 do believe that there are a million interpretation like there are pillars of course this is everybody agrees on this but if you could see the companions of the prophet everybody led a different life everybody had their own you know um understanding of, of the religion 
um, and you can you can see that in the in the in the life of, of the Prophet Muhammad and, the, and 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 how they led their lives after him. So we have a lot of interpretations, even in the simplest thing, even in the way we perform, uh, you know, pray the prayer, uh, even in in the, the call for prayer. In, in, in this reflects the beauty of Islam because it embraces the beauty of the human nature because we're so different, you know? We just, we have some pillars to abide by, but if you want to, you know, follow that scholar and, and stop following the other, that's perfectly fine. You're, you're perfectly able to do whatever you want, but just don't attack the other person. That's, that's the problem we're in right now. A lot, of, like a thousand sects, a thousand stream of, 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 of thinking and everybody's attacking the other. That's perfect. It's perfectly normal to have different thinking because we're geographically, you know, uh, you know, we're not living in the in the same place. So we have different needs and different understanding and different cultures. And Islam pays a lot of attention to the culture as well. You know, some of some of the pillars of Islam is the culture to abide by the culture. And something that is relevant in Tunisia is not really relevant in Indonesia, for example. Um, so we have to abide by that. It's perfectly normal to have different understandings and different you know things to follow but just do things try to abide by the pillars of islam that's one and two uh, don't attack the other persons because and don't consider yourself higher than them and more pious than them and and the don't don't just say that they're going to hell because a lot of people are doing that unfortunately um they're just you know they, ha they think they have the keys of paradise and and, and 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 they're just saying oh that person is a pious one the other person is not that's ridiculous and i think these things are that are manipulated from from above a lot of people like for example um in like um you know um during the french uh, colonization and the english colonization to many parts of the of the islamic world they tried to to play this very nasty game to just set people against each other to just set, set sects against each other races tribes and you know the country is is left behind even after the colonization tearing itself apart because of that you know so i think we have to the first thing to to to, to achieve you know greatness and democracy and complete freedom is to get rid of all of these things and just concentrate on what is common and embrace what is not common because it's beautiful, you know? So I'm really, sometimes when I, when I just try to watch something um, on TV and I find people still discussing these very, you know, ridiculous things, you know, the differences in some very tiny things in, 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 in you know, in the prayer or in the, in the call for, for, for prayer, if you're discussing it from, you know, a cultural point of view and embracing the beauty that we are in the same religion, but, you know, trying to, to see it differently, it's fine. But if you're attacking the other and saying that I'm, I'm the one who's correct, you know, you are wrong. You know, we're, you know, history is really, you know, we moved on and it's really, we don't have time for these kind of discussions. Well, I, I guess some of those discussions are small, but other, other, other parts of those discussion, trying to define the arena itself because mm -hmm. so on the one hand you're 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 talking about a peaceful democratic free tunisia yeah whereas there'd be other people who'd be in favor of <laughs> abolishing all borders and having this yeah. Right the <coughs> so, yeah so again <coughs> you're, in, you're in this place where you're having to kind of carve out a specific set of ideas that sort of define the rules of the game? Well, um, I always enjoy uh, taking the example of the European Union, where you have like uh, a lot of countries, many countries, <coughs> sorry, they have one uh, single economic system, you know, um, they have a political system that unites them, but at the same time, they are they they have their different cultural, you know, um, traditions and um, languages and all of these things. But are, but but they are brought together in a very beautiful way. So we can do that in the Arab world. We can have, you know, our own economic system, um, <coughs> one language, one religion, more or less. Um, um, and, and yeah, and enjoy, and, and this does not mean that we have to abolish 
our cultures and stop celebrating our uniqueness. Each country has their own uniqueness, you know? Um, it's true that the Arab world used to be one, uh, you know, and after um, Saika's people, you know, when they, um, in, 19, uh, in 1916 and 1917, when they more or less divided the Arab world in between um, uh, the UK and France, um, and after the um, after the um, after the the wave independence, um, they also um, the map themselves they they were changed. For example, Tunisia had you know a lot of lands that 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 are now part of Algeria and Libya. They used to be part of Tunisia, but it's no longer the case because you know they they chose to have a di different maps for us. They actually did this for us. Um, a lot of people are, are referring back to that and saying that we have to open borders and, and become one land. I don't think this is possible now, and I don't think it would be really worth doing because we can always just open the borders to have free trade and free, you know, transportation and, and, and everything and tourism and everything. Um, and we can have our own economic system and own political system like the European Union have has. Um, but we can enjoy our, you know, culture and our uniqueness to enrich the, you know, the Arab world. Not not just to divide us. It's just a way to in, to further enrich it. You know, um, yeah. So those people who are who are calling for the Khalifa and all of these things. It's, um, yeah. I respect their point of view, but um, it's really outdated. You know, and 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 um, I, I can always talk to them. Of course, I always have a lot of discussions with these people um and um i i admit that sometimes i can be wrong but i can change i can change my 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 opinion but the problem with these people even even those who have the most um you know extreme ideas if they're willing to change if they convinced with other ideas that's totally fine but the problem lies with people who are who perfect who are convinced that they have the they own the truth you know these people, whatever they got, they're going to say, I'm totally against them and always be against them because they're not willing to, to have a discussion in the first place. Yeah, that, that makes sense. So I, 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 I'm, I'm curious to get your, your input on something, but to lay the groundwork, I, I want to give some a little bit of background. Have you ever read um, A Letter Concerning Toleration by John Locke? Not really. I mean, I know the guy, but I have never read this. You should, you should read the letter because it, he's, okay. he's basically considered the father of free, to, free speech in the world. Yes, he is, yeah. Uh, and there's plenty of people before John Locke who, who supported free speech from... Muslim caliphs to Roman emperors. You, you always have people at specific times, which is usually tied to the security and confidence of the throne. But it's it, it, through, through John Locke and John Milton, it became institutionalized. Yeah. And the argument John Locke is making is that Jesus himself, when he disagreed with people, he never used force to coerce people to agree with him. In, in fact, he, uh, he, he didn't even resist his own death. He was prepared to die for the truth, not to take life for the sake of truth. And then when they yeah. killed him, he rose from the dead. Meaning that if, if Jesus, who, we, who Christians believe is God himself, actually does not use coercion on individual people and he uses and he uses persuasion instead how much more could we as his creatures treat each other in this way so the government's job is not to make sure that truth wins it's the government's job to create this free and fair arena because in a free and fair arena truth will always win so truth and error can do battle in the public sphere and people can decide for themselves in the trust that the truth will prevail. And, and so his appeal, his specific appeal is to the life and character of, of Jesus in a very, in a very tangible way. So, so where would you make your appeal 
what aspect of Islam Islamic history are you going to make your appeal to to say, okay, we should have liberty? Well, um, I believe that um, freedom is something really one of the pillars of Islam. And as I told you, if you are embracing Islam, you have to embrace it in a free way. It's a free choice. It's a free decision. You're not really forced to do that. Um, and if you're entering um, this um, system, there is a, per a particular order that you have to abide by. Because if you are free, freedom itself cannot really lead you anywhere. There has to be order. We as creatures, we, ha we, are, we have to be ordered. You, you give the example of the government. Um, the government should make sure that freedoms are there. But at the same time, you know, people can can have a million discussion about you know their their different opinions and everything but it has to be in an ordered way in an organized way because freedom without order and organization is nothing it will lead to actually further disorder and which is not really freedom per se um so um i would say that um you know muslims when they will go somewhere to to spread islam the first thing that would say is yeah to the rulers of that part of the world, um, we would like to exercise our, you know, our freedom to call for our religion. If they're they're not allowed to do that, then they will start fighting. And this is the misconception that a lot of people think they're just Muslim. They just go and conquer that place, and they're just force them to become Muslims. No, this is entirely against against Islam. And, and at some point, it happened. You know small small you know small incidents it did happen but these people do not represent islam just like a lot of christians so-called christians did a lot of things that has nothing to do have nothing to do with the you know the doings of jesus christ so 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 my appeal i would say um you know um whether what in whether when it comes to you know to the to freedom to the freedom of people entering islam or the freedom of you know um, exercising any kind of political life, um, you have to be free, but at the same time, you it has to be ordered. Um, so a lot of people, a lot of rulers are misusing this the the ordering you know part of the of the of the equation and misusing and abusing it and saying in the name of Islam we have to be you know, strong rulers, we have to, you know, jail everyone who dares say no and all of these things because Islam has to be strong and, and we represent Islam and all of these things. And there are others who are exaggerating in the other extreme, saying that we have to be completely free to do whatever we want. We have to say no to everything. We have to fight for this and all of these things. We still don't have a middle ground here, you know? This yeah. is the problem. We are looking for the middle ground. Like for example, before in the in the in the era of Ben Ali, before the revolution and pre-revolution Tunisia, the the thing, of course, he was using the religion as well, not entirely, because he was really secular. Secular, for example, we did not have the right to to wear the 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 scarf before. It's like a, a tiny front, <laughs> and um, so he was using this, uh, and nobody. Nobody, you know, dared say no. But right after the revolution, everybody started talking nonstop. It was chaos. You know, in 2011, 2012, it was completely chaos. But we, we were loving it at some point because we're not used to it. But then we realized that, you know, things cannot keep happening this way. We have to have a constitution. We have to have elections. We have to have order and organization. And, and we're trying, we're still trying to do this. And we did it, but there's a lot of challenges and a lot of you know obstacles so we're looking for the middle ground you know an ordered a, an organized freedom you know if i would say so yeah so how, where do you think that middle ground should be where yeah like what what we're not not like where geographically but what, yeah, yeah of course what, of course yeah what do you think that middle ground should be okay so it should be of course at the level of individual you know, so the relationship with the individual and him and themselves at the same time. So the way you, you deal with yourself, with your challenges, uh, the way you face, you know, you know, the obstacles. Um, and this is, should be taught and dealt with at school from an early age. I know it sounds cheesy, but it's really correct. Um, and um, it has to be, 
um, you know, in the government, it has to be, um, in, you know, uh, in, at the level of the president and the ones around him um, or, or her. <laughs> it has to be, um, you know, um, at the level of, you know, education, economy, trade, uh, relationships between countries, um, all of these things, relationships between scholars, relationships between, you know, um, religions, you know, representatives of, rel representatives of religion um, at every single level. And if a country wants to start this, they need to start with, you know, you know, infants, toddlers, even, you know, everything, parents, um, um, the family itself. And then, you know, as I said, education, economy, all of these things, there has to be a plan um, for every country to, to, to do this. Um, it, it, it's really, it's, it's a huge work. It, you know, a striking balance. By the way, I've always, I've always said this. Um, I read it somewhere and I, it really sounds great to me. The greatest um, way to worship God um, in Islam should be, um, you know, striking a balance in your, in your daily life and um, in your life, basically. So it's not really... Uh, performing prayers is not fasting is not charity it's striking a balance you know why because this encompasses everything for example you don't have to give charity you know and give all of your money and live you know without any penny and and and, and just consider yourself a good person you deprived yourself from from you know the, the important things to live on you know so you have to strike a balance in giving you have to strike a balance in you know in praying you can't just keep praying all day and neglect eating and, and and studying and sleeping and socializing and everything you have to strike a balance in every aspect of your life including um abiding by the ruler if if they deserve to to be abide abided by or um you know saying no and going into strikes and demonstrations and everything um um abiding by uh, the you know um values of islam and rules of islam and trying to also interpret some of them because some of them i wouldn't say outdated but the circumstances change it so you have to look for new ways to keep the spirit of islam but also you know be updated to this modern world it's all about striking the balance have you um have you ever done any reading on the protestant reformation in medieval europe not really, but I, I know a lot about medieval Europe. I, I think you'd find some some fascinating things to think about there because this is the Reformation is really the one example of this having gone really really well because in the French Revolution, as you know, right? They they yeah. get, rid of, they get rid of a king and they gain an emperor. It didn't yeah. quite, quite go the way they were thinking, but in the Reformation, it was a, it, it was a, it was a slower, steadier change, and there were plenty of imperfections in it. But you did have these gradual, gradual changes that shaped a lot of Europe into being freer societies, into being prosperous societies, where, where ultimately you have the right separation between religious powers and state powers and yeah but it was taken to the extreme at some point as well yeah it, it, it has it has been yeah but yeah but in but originally and for and for a long period yeah. of time even in the founding of america itself the separation yeah. of church and state didn't mean that religion has to be completely out of the public sphere it meant that it meant that there's no there's a, there's a separation of, of leadership and if you actually look at the the prophets if you look at king david's time if you look at the torah there's actually two distinct offices in 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 the nation of israel in the bible not the modern nation the, 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 yeah. in, in historical sense that you have the king which has one job which is the execution of justice for civil crimes, the protection against the nation's enemies. And then you have the priests, which are over the religious rituals and people's relationship with God. And both of these offices speak to each other, 
but they're not allowed to do each other's jobs. And what happens in the Reformation is you, go, you get a lot of you get a lot of thinking on how to define the job of the civil magistrate, the government, versus the versus the job of the church, which is the religious, which, and, and the role they have in speaking to each other. So the separate the separation of mosque and state, you, you tend you tend to have this unfortunate seesaw in the Middle East right now, where where you you kind of have difficulties of society and then it goes all the way religious so okay if we were just more religious all of our problems would be solved they do that they're not solved okay if we were just more secular all of our problems would be solved oh wait they're not solved we were more religious all of our problems would be solved and you're stuck you're stuck in this you're stuck in this sort of pendulum swing between these two things yeah and if if you're and it seems that the balance between the what the state has to do and what the religious authorities do yeah. is pretty central to the future of that. Well, um, it's really funny, just like you you were describing it. Um, but we have a very famous verse in in the Quran saying that um, you have um, to seek um, the knowledge of those who are, you know, who are knowledgeable of a, of, of a certain thing. And this is like a pillar for me, because if you are seeking um, the knowledge of politicians, go and ask politicians and make them in charge. Do not make a monk or a religious person or an imam um, in charge of um, the political life or the social life or the economic life. If you want to have economy, um, working well, you go and you know ask uh, an ec- someone who is good at an economy. So for me, this goes without saying. Even Islamically speaking, this has to. Be, I wouldn't say separate because the word separate means that you're 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 telling me not to abide by this by this rule, which which is Islamic and which tells me to go and put in charge, you know, a politician in to deal with the political life. Someone who's good at economy to deal with the economic life all of these things. So I wouldn't say separate because for me, Islam is a lifestyle that tells me to, you know, um, you know, not to, um, you know, um, use roles interchangeably because um, an imam is not there to deal with my political life or my social life or my economic life. You know, so for me, this goes without saying. And every, every, everything that they're doing in the, in, 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 in the East or in some Muslim majority countries, they're totally wrong. Why would someone who is who who has absolutely nothing to do with politics be um, you know a politician just because he he memorizes the entire Quran? It doesn't make sense. Even even Quranically speaking, you know the Quran that he is memorizing is saying otherwise. So so I'm perfectly for this you know civic state, but for me it I wouldn't say civic. I wouldn't say separate religion from 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 the state because for me religion is telling me. To put, you know, these people, you know, who are knowledgeable about these things in life in the, in these places, and not religious people in 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 a place of a president or a minister or a trader, you know. So it's it's a conceptual thing, you know. It's a conceptual thing. And and I agree. I actually I actually don't think it's possible to separate religion and government because ideas come from our worldview and our worldviews are re- religious ultimately it's religion like, what, yeah right what so even if you're an atheist and, and you believe that you still have a set of morals which you think absolutely okay, this should yeah. be put into law this should not be legal this should be legal uh, and, and so i i when i typically when i'm talking to americans i don't use the term separation of church and state because they misunderstand it I, there's a historic mm-hmm. meaning to it. It doesn't mean what they mean. It means, yeah, yeah, it means, absolutely. It means the separations of institutions. It doesn't mean that historically it means Jesus is king of everything on earth, everywhere, and he demands the government do one thing, and he demands the religious organizations to do a different task. Both of them absolutely. have to. Obey, both of them have to obey God. Uh, it, it's like we, you can't if, if you want just laws you can't just remove god from the equation it doesn't make sense 
I'm using this because um, in Tunisia, we're so perfectly, and unfortunately we are, um, you know, um, influenced by the French terms. And the French is, you know, France is a secular country. And the term laïcité, if you heard about it, um, they're just so afraid to have a king once again, you know, dictating everything on them and, you, and misinter misinterpreting, you know, religion and misusing the church that they're just, wanted to get rid of every aspect of religion, which is perfectly wrong, because if you're doing this, you're creating fanatics, you're creating extre extremists, you're, you're, creating, you're, you're doing the entire thing in a wrong way. So you just have to let everybody does what they want, uh, express their views. I've been to India yes, last year, and it's amazing. If you, can, you can actually see the the, you know, the, how perfect people can express their religious point of views, how, how they are free to do whatever they want. Of course, socially speaking, I'm not talking about politics here. That's another story. Yes. Um, but um, I don't know, like um, for me, um, you know, religion should not, should not really be completely separate. You can, you can't even separate it. Even people who are, you know, um, you know, um, pretending uh, even they're not conscious of it they're pretending to be completely um you know have nothing to do with religion they still have as you said um a set of morals a set of worldview and there's nothing wrong with having your own worldview from religion if you're re if you're a religious person um and and there's nothing wrong with having your moral views um uh, from you know your secular way of view but this does not necessarily mean that you have to completely separate both of them as long as the, not, there's not, nothing that is, you know, misusing the other parts of the equation. Right, right, which, which is, that, that's, that's, and that's part of the difficulty with, with this, is that I think so, so much of the time we're trying to change policy without discussing worldview. And so, and I think that's that's key to where, especially key to the part of the world you're in, is key anywhere. But that you have to have you have to have conversations about the worldviews underneath the policies, rather than just trying to talk about policies. So I think it's it's really great that you're engaging in the conversation of, okay, let's, let's talk about Islam and liberty. Let's try and work out what this actually means, mm. not simply. We want, to, and this is over here as well. And you, you're actually you're actually having conversations about those things. And I think that's an important thing to do. Yeah. So the the discussion about Islam and liberty um, is has to do with the context you're talking in. For example, in Tunisia, it's diff completely different from speaking about this um, in a non-majority Muslim world in the West, for example, or in Indonesia or in Pakistan, it's it's completely different. So it has to do with the context. So the problem we're, we're in right now is there are some scholars who are trying to talk about this and just um, you know painting everyone with the same brush. And this is this is not really possible. Um, in Tunisia, we have our own um, dilemmas, our own problems that are that are not really the same with the rest of the of the world. Um, so as I told you. Uh, I'm interested in this because uh, I can talk about it, um, you know, um, in, in two levels. The first level is um, Islam and liberty in the Western world because it has to do with Islamophobia. I have to talk about, you know, how these things are wrong and how Islam is not about violence and, and you know, bring a lot of ayat and hadith and, and a lot of things justifying that Islam is not about violence, um, you know, um, all of these things and trying to make people see that you know they're not it's not correct to be uh, you know fearful from you know some people who are trying to you know misinterpret the the religion and they're perverting it and all of these things um in the arab world in the muslim majority world um the discussion is different um uh, but we we do know that Islam is not about violence. We do know that, um, and and some people, some Westerners have been trying to implement this and enforce this and project this problem onto our communities. So some people are, are started to doubt their own religion, and this is really dangerous. 
But for now, these are minorities. And the problems we do have now in regards to Islam and liberty is the misconceptions, as I told you, from Muslims themselves. We have a lot of uh, gender inequality, uh, which is for me a form of violence and a form of, um, you know, um, it's not a form of freedom in, 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 in a Muslim country. So we have to fight that to liberate women, to liberate uh, children who are some, 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 somehow enslaved in some part of the, of the Muslim majority world. Um, we have to, you know, uh, fight dictatorships that are all over more or less the Muslim uh, majority uh, countries uh, because, you know, Islam is not for this, Islam is against this. Um, so granting liberty and freedom to the Muslim majority world um, has to do with this. This fight is, is, is about this. So as I said, so just to summarize, um, it has two layers for me. Uh, in, with regards to, to, to the Western world and non-Muslim world, it has, it has to do with Islamophobia and trying to explain that, Muslim, that Islam is not about this. It's, it's about you know, freedom of expression. It's about freedom of choice. It's about peace and all of these things. And it's about liberty and freedom granted to every person. And with regards to Muslim-majority countries, we have to fight all the aspects and manifestations of people who are enslaved in the name of Islam, um, not granted any form of liberty. Um, and this has to do with, you know, specifically with gender inequality, um, you know, problems that women are faced in the name of Islam, in the name of, you know, um, males who are authority, you know, they are, you know, stronger and have the, you know, more say uh, in, in, in most of the topics. Um, rulers who are trying to in, impose their dictatorships and, you know, injustice um, in the name of Islam as well. So there's a lot to do. There, there is a lot to do. And, it, and a lot of it, again, goes to this, to this worldview thing. So you're talking about gender inequality. Yeah. yeah there's plenty of, of amazing, fascinating women in Islamic history. I, I'm yeah. reading, I've, I've done lots of reading on Aisha in the last year. And mm -hmm. oh, oh my word, what an interest <laughs> on, on every level. The, yeah. it, for good for good and for bad right but so you've got you've got that but you've also got some things in the hadith themselves which are which would not move towards gender equality as well and so how, how personally just just curious for you and, and, this yeah. is, and this isn't an attack i'm just curious of how you personally navigate the things in the, the source material, which would, you know, denigrate women, which would put them as generally <coughs> biased than men. Well, if you would give me an example, I, I could probably answer in a better way. But yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I would, okay. when, um, yeah, whenever, go on, yeah. So you, just, it, just, just before that, um, whenever I feel sometimes I'm like a little bit, you know, uncomfortable with something like that I would face while reading, the hadith or, or uh, I would I would I would directly attribute that to a difference of a worldview that their era was is not like ours that it was okay to 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 to, to have sentences said like this or stuff like that in that place um you know that that we would feel uncomfortable now because it's so different but yeah just give me the example so that would be better so so an example of this um it's in Sahih al-Bukhari in, I don't, I don't remember the exact reference, but I can tell you how to find it. So if you look for the yes, um, the book of menstruations, uh, and it's and it's about the fifth one down, I think. Um, it, says, it says that that the prophet was giving a, a sermon on uh, Eid al-Adha, and he goes to the woman and says, "Give alms, O women, for I looked and saw the." majority of the inhabitants of hellfire were you women. And they said, why? Because it is because you're ungrateful. It says, ungrateful to Allah. It says, no, ungrateful to your, to your husbands. And then he goes on to say, uh, I've never seen a group of people more deficient in intelligence and piety than you women. And they said, why? And he said, and he said, 
is it not true that you need two witnesses, two female witnesses for every male witness in court? They say, yes, this is the deficiency in your intelligence. And then he said, and then he says, and then is it not true that you can't prey on your menstrual cycles? And then he says, and, and then they say, yes, and this is the deficiency on your, your religion. So that's, that's an example of something that would be used as a tool against women in the Muslim world to keep them suppressed. So what do you do with hadith like that? Yeah, I mean, you just literally answered yourself with, with the, the answer of the Prophet Muhammad. And um, there's a lot of, um, you know, when people give attention and, um, you know, um, kind of, um, you know, like, for example, when, 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 when he taught, taught that, said that uh, women are, you know, who are the most who are going to be in, in hell and not, in, you know, this means that they are also um, probably the ones who are going to be more in, in, in paradise more than hell because they can be both at the same time. That's how I read it. So, the, so, 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 and also the, the, the other part when they, when he said that you are, um, um, there's another hadith who said you are less intelligent, um, and, 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 and you are also less, um, you know, religious. And there is a fuss about this hadith. Um, uh, I'm just providing them in a very stupid, um, uh, interpretation, like, uh, translation, um, um, because people are just using this. I actually was accused of that some, some, in some part of the world, not in Tunisia, in a, some majority Muslim country, telling me that you don't have to interfere in the, you know, in the, um, in the um, political life or social life just because you're a woman. And the prophet said that women are less than men when it comes to intelligence, when it comes to religion. But this hadith has interpret has you know the interpretation of this hadith is not illiterate is not literal. Uh, because we are, you know, less intelligent because we are more emotional. That's what he meant, like more emotional because, you know, you know, science, even scientifically speaking, women, you know, they, they, you know, they are, when they are pregnant, they, you know, the hormones are all over the, all over the place and you, you know, you're, you know, women are more into, you know, sentiments and feelings and all this. And that's necessarily not a bad thing. It's really a good thing, you know? Um, and also, you know, less religious, religious, because we do not pray, um, you know, during specific parts of the month, um, you know, um, and this does not mean that we're not less religious, spiritually speaking. Um, so in this, in, in, in this regard, in the, with the same, in, with the hadith that you mentioned, um, it, this means that women have a lot of work to, um, you know, to, um, to pay attention to when it comes to, you know, um, their work to enter paradise because they can manipulate easily and they can be manipulated easily and they have a lot of responsibilities, which does not necessarily mean it that it's a bad thing. It's actually a good thing. And this does not mean that they are judged differently from men, you know, because for me, um, how can I say it? Um, like, for example, imagine that you are a person who is um, more into, you know, not giving charity. You're not, it's not that you're a bad person, but you find it hard to, to give charity, you know? When you actually give charity, it means that you are you're gonna be rewarded in a different way than the person who finds it so easy to, to give charity. So, do you see what I mean? I'm just, you know, trying to make it, you know, simple. Maybe I'm trying to make it complicated. Uh, so, so, for me, um, women who have you know more feelings and, and and more power to 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 do things whether to you know to other persons or, or to, to to herself um you know the, the 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 like like for example try to to understand in this regard this hadith and also the hadith that he said in the sermon of of Wada, the last sermon when when he emphasized on the fact that i really which means that I, 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 I call you to take care of women. I call you to take care of women. And he repeated it so many times. Does this mean that he is actually being mean to women? Just like because he said so at that, at that time with this hadith that you mentioned? It's, it's actually the opposite. So 
So that, that's how I try to read the hadith. I, I don't really focus on one hadith. It's like a, you know, a total of, of, of his sayings, just like the Quran. It's a total of, of things. It's, you know, you have to read the entire context. It's just, just not just one single thing that probably you would feel uncomfortable with. But if you try to read it from a different perspective, you, you would find it actually comforting. Well, that, and, that, and that's the challenge of this is that it seems like the hadith is like <clears throat> having six 10,000 piece jigsaw puzzles in one box and it's <laughs> and you're trying to make one picture out of them and it's a difficult task yeah yeah absolutely absolutely yeah. and so what you're trying to do essentially is going back <laughs> to the found trying to go back to the foundations and figure out okay what is what is the core and the essence of what is actually true and how does that impact us as a society how does that impact the nation and how does that impact the world absolutely yeah these are the questions that we always have to go back for but everybody who's trying to just you know zoom in the literal meaning or just you, somehow people are trying to just create problems out of nothing some books are being written just to just create problems not just to answer a question they just want to fill you with doubt that's all and that's really dangerous yeah there's this have you ever there's a guy called c.s lewis that he 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 said if you if you see through everything you don't see anything absolutely absolutely there i think some some hadith some hadith are there just to make us think and things think think uh things through and always have a kind of positive kind of doubt to, because it doesn't have to be all clear and all see through you have to have things to think through you have to you know try to find questions for yourself and what is good for you that is not necessarily good for other people um so you have to find your own you know um, um stability and your own um you know balance and, and that's actually the challenge it, it is i think that my, my, my one hope, one of my biggest hopes for, for the, the Muslim world right now is that in, the, in this quest for foundations, that people wouldn't simply take what they've been told as authoritative. We would actually go and dig and they would investigate and they would look at what is actually true, what is actually, what is actually real, and that there, there, there'd, there'd be a serious personal movement of Ijtihad, right? This careful weighing of, of what the foundations are yeah the and problem is that they're not really doing this i mean i hope more more people start to do this but we have many muslims who are muslims just by heredity they were born in a muslim country their parents are muslims they can't really take any other way other than that it's dangerous you have to read like at some point when i was a teenager i I wanted to ask about everything. I did a lot of readings. And then I, I said, I was telling my parents, I'm now a Muslim because I converted to Islam. I mean, the, the way that I wanted, because I, I read through, I, 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 I'm convinced, not just because you both are Muslims. And this is what we need, you know? So, um, and, 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 it, and it, it comes, you know, this thing is applicable to any other decision in life. Once you are convinced, fully convinced, of course, you can't really be perfectly satisfied. You always have to have that, you know, little doubt, um, positive doubt to, to keep looking for the truth and everything. But as long as people are just embracing things like that and anyone who's, who has starts having, you know, um, questions, just like the companions of the prophet always have had questions, always. And he has always been happy to, to answer them. Now, if you are in the Muslim majority, word and each country and you want to ask a religious question they would just you know not all of them but they would just you know shush you and that's it and 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 then you would just want to reject the religion and altogether and that's a you know that's a problem because you, you, you did not see its truth by for yourself and this is applicable to any other religion and any other decision in life y yes so you, you're making that decision in the midst of right you've got these two these two sides, one, it's got, you've got this very, on the one hand, you've got this very traditionalist, not allowing people to think for themselves. 
side of things. <laughs> and then it's just kind of hereditary. And then on the other yeah. side, you've got the West pushing in these days. And, and the, the message of the West seems to be, hey, come believe in nothing, just like us. Look how happy it is. <laughs> and you, you go, <laughs> so there's, there's people who want to take you want to take the core of what you believe and just replace it with air uh, and nothing and that's not going to help anyone absolutely yeah it's it's really dangerous like it's really really dangerous i can see um you know and these people who are saying hey can't believe in nothing are absolutely you know living a lot of challenges and the to, to, the, the the thing that they found to just stop this frustration is to have more people joining them just to make them th themselves believe that they are doing the right thing just because some other people a lot of people are joining them and these people who are joining them are not necessarily believing in what they're calling because they're calling in nothing absolutely but they're just frustrated because in their belief system whether muslims or jews or christians or anything else they were not you know in, they did not have any chance to think through that system and to ask their parents and to ask their scholars and because they they've always been stopped from doing this so they're all now believing in nothing and and that's a problem even if it was like not like even believing in like you know there, there are people who believe in the existence of god and that's it you know um that's actually better than not believing in anything and the problem is that they don't do not have any arguments like if you believe in nothing that's still fine you are perfectly fine like you you can you can believe in anything but just try to convince yourself first you're not even convinced that's the problem that i sometimes deal with with atheists i mean or any other persons if as long as you are happy and satisfied with what you are believing in you can perfectly convince yourself good for you but if you are just all over the place and trying to call people to join you just to feel safe and secure, that's a problem. That's really a problem. Right. So I think as, as, as a Christian, I think, I think one of my frustrations is that a lot of people just want to export America or export the West to, to the rest of the world without critically engaging with our own problems. And that's, that, that's, that's very frustrating for me. And I think what I'm trying to do is help people think through ideas. And these are ideas that I think every nation needs to think through as well. So my main hope for the, your region of the world and for you personally is that you, you, that you wouldn't, you don't, you in, investigate into the history of the prophets as a whole, because there's a lot of wisdom that I think that Muslims are missing out on in the, in the stories of the, of the prophets that they don't get to read because they're just told that, Oh, it's corrupt. But they're not told what percentage is corrupt. Why is this corrupt? When did this happen? Right. They're not encouraged to look at it themselves. And I think every, every Muslim owes it to themselves to look into the history of the prophets. And, Absolutely. And I, think the, and I think the other thing would be learning from the Protestant Reformation, because this is the one example in history of people doing really, really successfully what you guys are trying to do now. And I think you benefit immensely from it. Yeah, I, I agree. And uh, as long as it, as as uh, as long as uh, the you know the stories uh, of prophets um, are concerned, um, you know the Quran is all about stories of of, of different prophets. And uh, you know the in the Hadith, of course, there's a lot of mentioning to a lot of prophets. We have, I mean, in the Quran there are surahs with every the name of every prophet actually, um, and even um, you know. Um, uh, Mary as well. So we have a lot of, um, you know, uh, mentioning and stories told about the, 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 you know, the, the stories of, of the prophets um, and also um, a lot of history books, a lot of hadith, a lot of things that, you know, I do believe in all the, 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 the prophets as a Muslim. And um, you're right, a lot of Muslims are missing out on this. They're not really um, reading. Um, they're not really reading Quran in the first place. Um, right. And um, 
Yeah, and um, it's really important to them in the, these stories. Um, so they need to be um, studied and they need to be understood. Um, and also the great histories, um, you know, different uh, human uh, experiences when it comes to overthrowing injustice and overthrowing dictators and, you know, uh, trying to make healthy revolutions with great outcomes. Um, the problem with the Arab world that we're not, we don't, we do not read and we do not write as well. Yes, I'm, that's, that's actually why I'm really glad you came on this for video because I've, I found that Arabs will generally watch videos more than they will even listen to things. True. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, you're right. You're right. You just. Um, try to heal a problem with a very good tool. Uh, people do not read, people do not write. And for a long time, scholarship has been associated with these dictators. So you would read to praise the ruler or you would write something, um, you know, to, to praise the ruler or it has absolutely nothing to do with academia and, and, and scholarship. These things are slowly, um, you know, stopping right now. Um, they're being limited. People are writing more about so many things, so many important things. People are making a lot of revisions because revision is at the heart of history anyway. So things are progressing. And, and that's actually, and that's one of the parallels I'm talking about of, of why people need to read about the Reformation because you're in the exact same position before the Reformation that no one reads a thing. Everyone's just dependent on, depending on scholars to tell them what they're supposed to think and believe. And nobody yep. actually actually checks anything out for themselves and uh, the the basic underlying movement in the reformation is a, is a movement about literacy because it coincides not just with the printing press but with a culture of literacy and reading and that is really what transforms the world absolutely yeah absolutely well yeah thank you so much for taking the time You're to welcome. do this i appreciate you you having this conversation Love to do it again sometime, and let's, let's let's keep in touch. I'd love to send you some books if you're interested. Please, yeah, I am interested. I'm sorry it's very late for you, and you're you're so energetic. You seem really, you know, you don't, you're not asleep at all. You don't, you're not sleepy. So it's interesting. I can see how interesting it is is for you to talk about these things. Oh yeah, I am. Um, I am yeah. juiced. And <laughs> if you ever want to come to Seattle. If you, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If, if you take care of airfare, we'll have you on the show. Everything else will be taken care of. Food, accommodation, oh. that's my... That, <laughs> thank that's, you so much. Thank well, you so much. Thank you. Well, thank you for being here. And, and thank you guys for listening to the Almeida Initiative podcast. We will be back next week with another episode. 